So good evening, thank you very much, and welcome to our uh, Reinventing Dialogue series. So this is one of the many dialogue series, uh, Reinventing Dialogue that we've had. So last year we had uh, reinvent, uh, a dialogue series uh, on Reinventing Plastic Bottle. That was very timely when Blue Planet came out and we had a full house. We had an installation on um, you know, different kind of uh, art that you can make out of plastic uh, floating in the ocean. So, and then we had a reinventing building and we had architects coming here with 3D printers doing all sorts of cool stuff and reinventing fashion. I've never seen so many fashionistas at Chatham House uh, then. So now we have reinventing meat. After this, you, we will, you, there will be a presentation upstairs, uh, installation so that you can get to exhibition, installation, you know, to kind of, for us to kind of get into the idea of the future of meat. Um, so welcome everyone, thank you for being here. Um, so this, is, this event is live streamed and this is not under Chatham House rules. So you can tweet, you can take pictures, you know, share. Um, you can ask questions online too at, at Hoffman Center Twitter account using the hashtag ReinventingMeet. And so we just, I will have a very quick introduction about Hoffman Center. So this is, um, Hoffman Center is a research uh, center here at uh, Chatham House. And our objective is to think about sustainable resource economy and how both citizens, individuals, and environment can thrive together to, to today and the future. So we kind of think about you know, what we need to do today for a better future. And the Reinventing Meat is, sits in between two work streams that we do, one on shaping future demand and the other one on around the impact of land economy and the sustainable food system. So we have a great panel of speakers. So each one will have five minutes. Uh, so I will start with Rosie. Uh, Rosie is a program director at Jeremy Collar Foundation. Uh, she manages the foundation strategic program to end factory farming. And in December 2015, uh, Jeremy Collar Foundation launched the FAIR initiative, which I think many, one, many of you probably know of. It's a global investor coalition focused on financial risks and opportunity linked to the food sector. And since the launch of FAIR, it has built a network of investors that has a combined asset of 12 trillion. Uh, to support programs including uh, you know, engagement around alternative protein and the importance of diversifying protein supply chain. Uh, Rosie also is an advisor of Cap CPT Capital, which is a venture arm of Jeremy Kohler private family office. Uh, Rosie is a long-term dedicated investor in the alternative protein space. So thank you, and you provide your insight into why thank you, you invest in space. Thanks for the introduction and delighted to be kicking off such a great panel today. So I guess just to set the scene for the session, I kind of want to give an overview of our work at the Jeremy Collar Foundation, our work with investors, why we're seeing investors engaging on this topic of reinventing meat, and at a high level, what we're seeing in terms of the innovation and technology kind of coming down the pipeline here. So just this background, um, our founder, Jeremy Collar, he's you know, an investor himself. He's a pioneer in the private equity industry. And so six years ago, when we started looking at sustainable food systems as an issue, we were kind of thinking about our strategic focus and how we as an organization could really impact and improve the food system. And it seemed natural that we would work with investors um, because that's our background and really make the case around the financial risk and opportunity presented by the food sector, um, and intensive meat production in particular. And what we wanted to do is basically help investors to understand the issues and then engage with the global food companies that they're, that they're investing in and that they own to help to improve practices. So specifically, what we've done, um, as just mentioned in the introduction, we've started a coalition called the FAIR Initiative. It's a global investor network which essentially applies an investment lens to the food sector. 
Um, and so in a nutshell, what we do is take the negative impacts of the sector, which we all know about, and I'm sure everyone in this room is very familiar with, um, summarized on the slide there at a high level, the main risks, and we translate these into um, potential investment risks. So just to give, I guess, a couple of illustrative examples here, um, at take antibiotic resistance, which is on the slide. So we're clearly seeing rising resistance in humans globally, and this is um, largely driven by overuse in animal production. The majority of antibiotics globally are used in intensive livestock production. And so investors, what does this mean? I mean, there's real long-term economic risks here. Um, it's set to cost the global economy $100 trillion by 2050 if we don't stem the tide of antibiotic resistance now. But in the shorter term, we're also you know, already seeing risks emerge. So you've got reputational risk for companies who aren't um, taking account of this and adopting more sustainable practices with consumers boycotting certain companies or opting for antibiotic-free meat. You've also got serious kind of regulatory risks and issues there. Um, just at the end of last year, for instance, we had the EU ban new, um, bring in new legislation banning routine use of antibiotics in livestock systems, which will come into force in 2022. So that's just one example on a kind of thematic level. If you take com a company example, just to illustrate this, JBS, which is the largest meat producer globally. Um, they've been impacted in recent years by both food safety and uh, deforestation, which are two of the key risks that we cover. Um, they lost over $2 billion in market capitalization just last year because of scandals around expired meat in their supply chain and also kind of um, investigations around illegal deforestation, which was a real concern. So. I hope I've kind of shown there that even on, a, on an individual level, these risks are quite compelling. But if you look at them all together, this almost creates a kind of a perfect storm or confluence of factors, which really means that business as usual isn't an option for the meat industry. And that's why we're getting such great traction with investors. Although FAIR's only three years old, we've brought together this coalition of over $12 trillion of combined assets. This is a global network of investors who want to understand and engage on these issues. So coming to reinventing meat specifically, um, building on the risk case that I just outlined, we have identified at FAIR four key um, drivers, essentially, for the food industry in moving away from current methods of meat production or diversifying their protein supply chains. Firstly, you know, the market opportunity here um, for plant-based and alternative proteins is booming. There's a clear opportunity. It seems like every other month there's new market data around you know, massive increase in sales and growth for this sector globally. The business risks, as I just outlined, um, are pretty clear too, and companies really need to reduce their exposure to, um, to meat. Um, we have growing advocacy and regulation around these issues, especially around the need to reduce meat consumption in order to avoid dangerous and irreversible climate change. And all of this, very relevant to the session today, is supported and enabled, really, by this developing pipeline of innovation and new companies working to create meat without the animal and um, create meat in a more efficient and sustainable process. So just focusing in on the innovation piece, um, through all of this work that we've been doing for the last couple of years, we've kind of um, been doing a lot of research in-house, collaborating with profits like the um, nonprofits like the Good Food Institute, and we've developed an understanding of, I guess, the type of technology and innovation that's developing that has the potential to reshape the meat industry. Um, and we're seeing here, which I've just tried to outline at a very high level, two main categories. And it's great that we've today on the panel got a representative of two of the leading companies in both of these categories, corn and mosa meat. So I won't go into detail. Um, but essentially, on the top, we have plant-based, which is biomimicry of meat products using plant-based sources, optimized for taste, texture, and nutrition. Um, many of the newer companies are using kind of novel plant-based sources, like lupin and mung bean, and innovative processing methods, like shear cell technology. And then along the bottom, we've just got some examples of cell culture, which is growing actual meat um, directly from cells, and sometimes called lab meat, but that's very misleading because it won't be produced in a lab, as I'm sure Josh will tell you. Um, so here on this slide, I'm just trying to show, we've, we're having innovation across all categories here, so pork, beef, chicken, fish. Um, 
And because I'm running out of time, just briefly, I mean, the two things that I find particularly promising from this type of tech and innovation that we're seeing, firstly, the pace of development and scale up of these products and how quickly they're coming to market and costs are coming down is really encouraging to me. Um, secondly, I mean, all of the companies on this slide are startups, um, but I think really indicative of where this whole movement is going is how the major mainstream corporates, including the likes of M&S, are really embracing this. Um, and we're seeing several strategies emerge um, for these corporates, um, actually addressing this through acquisitions, venture investments, their own product R&D, and even setting up kind of separate plant-based subsidiaries. Um, so I think it's a very exciting area. I'll leave it there and hand over to the people who are actually doing this and leading this innovation. But hopefully I've made the case that reinvention of meat is both necessary and it's already underway. Thank you, Rosie. Um, so now I have Joshua. Josh, right? We had agreed that it's Josh, not Joshua. Yeah. So he's a, sci a senior scientist at Mosa Meat and he's a team leader. Um, there as well, um, leading cultured company, uh, sorry, cultured meat company based, based in Maastricht, Netherlands. So prior to his move to the, con to the continent, we're still part of Europe, uh, Josh completed his PhD at the lab, Laboratory of Mo Molecular Biology in Cambridge, working on strategies for colon cancer treatment in the lab of Dr. Marianne Biens. Yep. Okay, and you're a keen sailor, a skier, and Josh is acutely aware of the impact of the meat industry on the environment and is working to reinvent meat in an environmentally sustainable way. Over to you. Super, yeah, thanks. Uh, it's, uh, this is kind of the first time that I've done something like this. It's really nice to get the uh, invite. It's nice to be back in the UK. And um, it's obviously wonderful to see so many people are interested kind of in this space. Um, when I kind of got the brief that I was going to be talking here, I really kind of homed in on this keyword reinvention and tried to think what this actually means. And I kind of came up with a few different examples here. Um, in throughout human history, we've been very reliant on animals uh, to solve a number of our kind of biggest problems. Some of them are shown here, and through um, uh, the work of you know, many um, incredibly clever people along the way, we've been able to really replace animals in a lot of these processes with machines which can perform the same task in a much cheaper, cleaner, more efficient, and kind of generally um, all around vastly superior way. And we can see here that, you know, it's now possible to send an email around the world in a matter of seconds. We can traverse continents in a matter of hours. But when it comes to meat, really, we're kind of doing the same thing that we have been doing for thousands of years. And as a, well, if you've made it kind of this far to this event, then I'm sure you are probably already aware, or at least suspicious, that a cow is actually a pretty bad meat machine. It's really inefficient. And what we are at Moza Meat is we are inventors and scientists. And I'd like to kind of use my slot to just present kind of our vision of what this second panel in this, uh, in this meat um, reinvention scheme maybe will look like. So this is, I'm going to run through our kind of uh, meat machine here that we're kind of working towards. Um, there's five kind of different parts of the process. And I'm aware that some people kind of will have more of a biological background than others. But hopefully, you should kind of be able to follow what's going on. On the far kind of left-hand side of our machine, we've got the, um, the sample input. So we take a very small sample of muscle um, from an animal. In this example, we're taking it from a cow. And if we kind of zoom in on this muscle sample, then we can actually see a functional muscle fiber. And surrounding the muscle fiber are these satellite cells. And these are stem cells. They're present in all of your muscles. And their task basically is to, um, to replenish or rebuild the muscle um, when it's damaged, either through exercise or through injury. So uh, what we do for the cultured meat process is we, we take these cells, we separate them from the muscle fiber, and we uh, get them to proliferate. Uh, and they're very happy to, uh, to, to grow and divide outside of the animal, uh, provided you give them the right nutrients and growth factors. 
and they will divide in an exponential fashion. So what I mean by that is if on uh, a given day you've got a million cells, the next day you'll have two million, and the day after that four and eight million. And if you do the maths, it turns out that you can really actually make quite a lot of, grow quite a lot of cells um, in, a, in really not that much time. So once you've uh, grown your satellite cells and you've got the number that you decide that you want, which is typically going to be a few billion or maybe even hundreds of billions, then you can, um, moving, the, they'll be passed on to the next kind of section of the machine where with the help of edible um, gels or scaffolds, the cells will be, uh, will be aligned and the scaffolds basically provide an environment that mimics the real muscle environment that you would find in the, in the cow. And once the cells are aligned like this, they will actually fuse to produce these uh, functional mini muscles. Uh, and this fusion process is, is the exact same process that occurs naturally in the cow uh, when it exercises, when it grows, or, or if it suffered an injury. So once we form these mini muscles, uh, the next step is to basically uh, give them exercise. Like all muscles, they need exercise. And we basically uh, we do this by uh, stimulating them to contract. There's a number of ways you can do this. One of the simplest is to basically uh, arrange them around a pillar, at which point their inherent contractile nature will, will um, trigger them to, to contract around that pillar. And this uh, workout, like uh, if you went to the gym and, and worked out, it stimulates the muscles to grow. It stimulates the production of muscle proteins, which give these muscles the typical texture and flavor and also the color that you would expect from, from meat. Um, and the, the final step, once we've got those, is to obviously assemble them into, a, into an actual meat product. The middle picture you can see here is actually the first ever cultured hamburger. It's actually my boss, my current boss, holding it. Uh, this was made in 2013, and it cost about 300,000 euros. <laughs> so obviously that's that's not going to work. But but all uh, but all technology starts off uh, starts off very expensive. Um, the 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 first burger was only muscle. Um, we're now working to. Uh, incorporate fat cells which are, um, which are uh, created via a kind of analogous process. And that will give us a, a product which ultimately uh, has much more closely mimics your, your traditional burger. Um, thinking a little kind of step back, if we want this machine to replace one cow, then we would need it to probably be making somewhere in the region of 400 to 500 grams of meat per day. Um, and based on our current calculations, assuming that this um, hypothetical meat machine is, is powered by a renewable energy source, we expect that the carbon footprint of such a burger should probably be somewhere around 20% of that of a traditionally uh, reared burger. And there are a number of other advantages as well in terms of space and the machine doesn't need to walk around and it won't get ill. So um, yeah, ultimately, this is what we're working towards. Further down the pipeline, we had hoped to be able to create more complicated meat products like a steak, which obviously has a, a, a more intricate three-dimensional structure. But yeah, we're really hopeful that this and, and other alternative protein sources that, that have already been mentioned and what I'm sure will be discussed will kind of hopefully make a make it viable to eat meat in the future. Because at the moment, we're kind of headed for a future where it's really not going to be possible. Thank you. Did you, have you actually tried? I haven't, no. OK, just. I'll let know. you know as soon as I have tasted <laughs> some. OK, cool. Um, so next, uh, we have uh, Tess. So Tess is a sustainability project officer at Corn. So she's worked at the food industry for four years, and her area is researching on the behavioral aspect of meat reduction and the role of meat alternative in transitioning to plant-based di plant diets. So Tess is currently working at Corn Foods as part of the in-house sustainability team, who's focusing on building and communicate the evidence base for mycoprotein. Uh, she has a master's degree in nutritional health psychology at Nottingham, Nottingham University. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, again, great to be here. First time for me as well. Um, 
You might be surprised to, um, to hear that Quorn does have a psychologist in their sustainability team. It might seem like a strange concept, but of course, um, again, I was ruminating on the reinventing um, language. And if you're going to reinvent anything, I'm sure Josh will attest to this, then you have to fully understand uh, what you're trying to reinvent. And the same is true of behavior change. Um, it's not good enough to just look for quick solutions. We have to really understand what we're trying to fix. Um, on that note, let's get into it. I've got a lot to cover. Um, mine are a little bit more conceptual than yours, I apologize. You might not be clear what you're looking at here, but um, it's, it's an image that's really resonated with me as a symbol um, of some of the, um, the, the biggest, most, most poignant problems, I think, with the way that we um, produce meat at the moment. Um, it's an aerial shot of one of the feedlots um, in Texas. So all those little ant-like dots that you can see there are cattle. Um, and that kind of beautiful colored pool uh, to one side are the waste streams um, coming off, which are obviously the runoff uh, from this cattle. And I won't, I won't linger on the, the problems of animal welfare, et cetera, biodiversity loss that this represents. But um, as a symbol, um, I think this is really important. I'm sure it resonates with some of you as well. And food itself is symbolic. It's not. A, a, a simple behavior change, nutritional behavior change is one of the most challenging that we see in health psychology. If it was simple, we would have curbed some of the obesity crises and, and, and other, other types of issues a lot sooner than we, than we have and are still tackling. Uh, meat itself is unique as a food product. Um, meat is a symbol. It's a very powerful symbol. It's intertwined with all kinds of emotions around pleasure and gender even, sexuality, sex itself, health, wealth. Um, and it's a complex symbol as well. There is um, a, something called the meat paradox, uh, which you may have heard of. Um, humans are not very rational beings. We like to think we are. Um, however, we are able to hold two opposing opinions in our head and behave in very incongruent ways with our beliefs and, and values. Um, so for example, I think a lot of you here um, may enjoy eating meat. Um, but I would also guess that most of you here also don't like killing animals. Um, and we can hold these two beliefs um, in, in our heads at the same time and behave in quite odd ways. Humans are quite strange. Um, but what this, uh, what this means is when we are challenged on some of our behaviors um, that are incongruent with our values, um, this creates psychological distress. It's something called cognitive dissonance, which is a term coined by Festin during the 1950s. Uh, it's a well-established psychological concept, easily measured. Um, and it creates a, a motivational state. You want to get out of this psychological distress. You want, you want to be congruent with yourself and, and, and your beliefs and your values. Um, and so we have strategies to reduce that sort of dissonance and, and that stress. Um, when we talk about justifying our meat consumption behavior, for example, if you speak to anyone about, okay, why do you eat meat if you um, disagree with the climate implications or the health implications, they tend to fall into four broad categories. Uh, they're called the four N's, which is nice and easy to remember. Uh, the first one being that uh, we tend to talk about meat being natural, uh, hunter-gatherer, as it's natural for us to eat meat as, as humans. Um, the second is that it's necessary, uh, so necessarily for health and, and well-being. Um, the third is that it's normal, uh, which I think is actually one of the most powerful. Uh, so social norms are obviously incredibly powerful in directing our behavior. And the fourth one is that it's nice. <laughs> um, and I think that's really important when we are reinventing meat in this way, um, to, if we're going to completely replace or somewhat replace um, some of these issues here, we really need to make sure those needs are somewhat fulfilled. And I also think some of our justification strategies that you tend to hear can take on a more sinister tone. So if you um, present information to somebody who eats a lot of meat, um, about climate change or health, for example, um, you can then um, run a test of measures on things like animal mind or their perception of how intelligent animals are, how much they might feel pain, uh, for example, and their perception of vegetarians and vegans. And that threat can actually produce some really quite stark and significant results in the way that we actually relate to each other and relate to, um, to animals. And I think there's something quite poignant in, in that. Um, what's true of behavior change? Um, for all that we've failed and tried and a myriad of behaviors is that information is not enough to change behavior. Information appeals are not enough. Um, 
we have over 40 years of research showing that plant-based diets are good for health um, and a, a, you know, a similar amount of time for, for, for planetary outcomes as, as well. And that hasn't done any, anything as much as the Eat Lancet report has had um, impact. This isn't new information to us. So, so what's really changing now? When we think about meat as a symbol, perhaps one way of thinking about how to change behavior is that we might need a more powerful symbol. Um, where, um, where meat perhaps is related to um, aspects like masculinity and gender, I think some of what we're seeing in the climate action and the climate movement, particularly for young people, is really interesting in the terms of the nature of that symbol. Mother Earth, Gaia, in all our mythologies, nature is seen as somewhat feminine. I don't think it's a, necessarily a coincidence that a young woman has started this movement, just to say. <laughs> um, I think this activates different schemas when we think about self-transcendence. Our health is still very personal. It's relative. We can look online for nutrition information and basically corroborate any diet we want to if we like, whereas the climate science is very clear. And we have a generation now that are very good at finding that information. They are very good at weeding out what they think is right and true. And we've seen this sort of activism, this motivation, this cognitive dissonance that this is creating is creating a real real movement that has a, a meta symbol that's very important. And I know I haven't much time, so I will move on to corn. Um, I, <laughs> this, I don't know whether you can see this, and it's maybe more pertinent if you can't. So these are actually the spores from the fungus that we use to create microprotein. So we've heard a little bit about plant-based diets. We actually, corn actually represents the third kingdom. So we are microfungi based. So the same family as yeast, truffles, <laughs> if you like. Um, we start with these spores, um, and they can create <laughs> up to 45,000 tons of microprotein, which if you were to take that amount of animals or chickens, you're looking at hundreds of thousands, if not millions. We've done the calculations, but I won't say them here because the, the numbers are staggering, as you can imagine. Um, we're a pioneer of research in this area. Corn's been around for longer than I've been alive, <laughs> so I'm very proud to be speaking on their behalf. But in terms of discovery of a new food, the technology to grow it at scale, and, the, and corporate responsibility as well. So we've done over 10 years of research into our carbon footprint, our climate impacts, and we continue to have very clear ambitions in this area because brands are a symbol too. We have to stand, we, you know, there are misconceptions about the food industry and, you know, that we haven't always been <laughs> the best, I suppose, but brands can be powerful and we, uh, we are proud to be um, part of the Carbon Trust's climate leadership framework as the first food manufacturer to start looking at a roadmap to climate positivity and net positivity. Um, and in terms of ease of behavior change, of course, corn, you, loads of you have probably experienced corn, we are um, all about accessibility, affordability. We go into schools with a great team of home, home economists and we educate children just on the basics of cooking even, chopping vegetables. It's these sort of skills that make this sort of behavior change very challenging. Um, and I'll leave it there, but three challenges that maybe we will face are silos in science, that's nutritional science, climate science, um, politics especially, um, business even, um, and the media. Um, secondly, protecting and maximizing the health benefits of plant-based diets can sometimes get lost. I know some of our other speakers will speak to this in terms of the, um, the focus on climate and carbon at the moment, um, and um, restoring smallholder um, farmer livelihoods as well. I actually grew up on a beef farm, so I've come full circle. My mum forgives me, don't worry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thank you, Tess. I mean, the whole cognitive dissonance, I am the embodiment of it. I am Brazilian, so I love meat, but being a climate activist, like I have so much guilt when I eat it. So yeah. anyway, um, so there we have, speaking of power of brand, so we have Mike Berry. He's the director of Sustainably Business, Marcus Spencer. Marks and Spencer, sorry, not Mike and Spencer. Um, <laughs> sorry, my bad, speaking of meat. Uh, sustain so he's, um, Job is to work at the MS leadership team to integrate sustainability into the heart of the business across the customer's proposition, the global retail channel, and supply chain. And it includes developing business case, coaching and mentoring colleagues, changing businesses' processes, customer and, and stakeholder engagement, and different uh, business model innovation. And he's a visiting fellow at Smith Center for Enterprise and Environment at Oxford University, and a senior associate at Cambridge Program for Sustainable Leadership. 
and you're a chemist. Like many, training. many years ago. <laughs> thank you. And, uh, and thank you, Tess, for just reminding me of my mortality here, because I knew one of the scientists who invented corn before you were born, so a little reminder of <laughs> the generational shifting that's happening up here. Let me just do two or three things br very briefly in the next five minutes. I mean, firstly, let me just acknowledge that the global food system needs to change profoundly in the next decade. No one can read the uh, UN's 1.5 degree report, the biodiversity report that's just come out this weekend, the net zero report that's come out from the Committee on Climate Change that shows us the pathway into a better future. All of these point to dramatic shift in the way that we live our lives, the economy and society that we live in. Now, some sectors have started that shift. If we look at what's happening in the power sector, the, the rapid shift now away from coal into wind and solar is happening. We look at what's happening in cars, the shift away from the internal combustion engine to the electric vehicle has started. Now, interestingly, the power sector change has largely been driven by bureaucrats and professional business people behind the scenes making change. It's not really touched consumers' lives. The shift for the car industry is different. People have to want to buy the electric car, not be worried about range anxiety, understand how to recharge. So they've got some real challenges functionally on change and emotionally. But that is nothing compared to the emotional change that we were required to do with the food system. So I'm saying very, very clearly to you, in the next decade, the global food system has to reinvent itself. And we're in the foothills of doing that. And I think what's happened with plastics is the first indication of the profound change that's coming. So the plastics is the delivery mechanism of choice to put trillions of items of food and drink onto the global marketplace at the moment. That has to change by 2025. And I think Ellen MacArthur Foundation has done a great job at articulating what an endpoint is that we're trying to reach. When it comes to other aspects of change in the food industry, and let's just you know, focus in on the world of meat, that endpoint is not defined yet. Lots of people sense a problem, write about the problem. Lots of other people push back to say, what you're asking me to do is impossible or wrong. So this Hoffman discussion today is still very, very important to start to articulate the many different views and respect them to get that pathway forward. So my second point is very much about what's going to happen to meat. It's going to go three different directions. We've heard two brilliant presentations already about plant-based, what's going to happen in cell culture. I also believe profoundly that we also have to change the meat industry for the better itself. We can't just push it to one side and expect it all wither and disappear. It won't. The sheer amount of meat consumed on this planet today and in the future demands that we work with the meat industry to improve it significantly. Absolutely have to do that. Now, m has launched a plant-based um, range, Plant Kitchen, 50 lines back in January. We've just added another 10, 15. It has flown off the shelves. Fantastic response to those products. So again, for us and all the other retailers, everybody else is doing this, there's a real profound shift into the world of flexitarian. We've interviewed 15,000 customers. 26% of them told us they were active flexitarians looking for different options out there. Still having meat, but want a plant-based diet as well. So how do you start to also then change the meat industry for the better? And this is why I stress the word foothills, because I see many building blocks that will allow us to take that industry on a journey. And people have started to talk in terms of climate change generally, in terms of a just transition. And just to say to farmers, you must change because we scientists have found something in London that you need to respond to in Scotland, ain't gonna cut the mustard. We have to take people with us. So that starts with transparency. We have to know who the beef farmers, the chicken farmers, the pork farmers are in the supply chain. And you'd be surprised on a global scale how many big food businesses don't know that. M&S knows all 7,000 beef farmers, many, you know, individual man, a woman, a son, a daughter, running a small farm. We know who they are, where they are. You have to have a science-based target as a business that recognizes it's a food business. Your operational carbon footprint is but a fraction of your total footprint. So dr uh, committing with a science-based target to drive down the totality of your footprint across food waste, deforestation, preventing that, and working with the meat industry, equally important. We've done some great work with Forum for the Future have helped us understand our overall meat footprint and our pathways forward to reduce that footprint as well. So again, you've got to do that strategic research. We and many others are supporting now R&D into different feeds, different soil management systems, different breeds, all of which are viable alternatives ways of taking the footprint reduction forward. We've worked with indicator farms, 45 indicator farms, that showed there's at least a 10% efficiency saving just from running a farm better. No additional cost, 
just doing it. And I love the work that's happening in Ireland. Bob Beer is now working with 50,000 Irish farmers, supporting them with carbon footprinting and helping them understand how to drive it down with today's technologies. The National Farmers Union has set, stepped forward with a commitment to be net zero by 2040. Now, no one quite knows the detail of how to get there in the way that I don't. But that is an industry that's looking into the mirror and saying, we might not like all the challenge we're getting, but we have to change. And we have to support that as a, as a, as a food retailer. You've got the round table on sustainable beef, again, that's bringing global businesses together, the Moors, the Nestle's, the Unilever's, uh, the Tesco's, the M&S's, to work together to drive change. Because as much as I will compete on Plant Kitchen to outsell my competition on having the best plant-based alternative, I think when it comes to changing the meat industry, we need far more collaboration. We need to work with industry in its entirety to drive the change that we need. So the final point on how to get change, I'd go back to that world of just transition. We have to show farmers that there is a pathway forward, there is a positive future for them in rural communities. Some of that will be about better meat, some of it will also be about making sure that they can uh, lock up carbon in soil, be paid for it, reforestation and renewables as well. There are so many opportunities from the low carbon future as well as challenge as well. So that's where I'll finish. The food industry has to change dramatically. We have to experiment with all the things that we've been speaking about here, but we will take the food, the meat industry and the farming community with us and support them on their transition as well. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. I think we, the food system needs to go through the same journey that the energy system went through so that we can get to the below, well, the two degree or even the below two degree, right? And last but not least, we have the amazing Simon. Uh, he's the executive director of Eating Better. It's an alliance of over 50 civil society organizations in the UK. So Eating Better is accelerating action to reduce meat and dairy. Should I let you talk about uh, eating better, or I, or I, I can do that, but I just no, yeah, I can. It's hard, isn't it, going at the end of that panel? Yeah, I'm, I'm sure you're going to bring on an, like emo the whole on an emotional topic. On an emotional topic. No, no, well. We've been on this journey, and there's this is the funny thing about being in a. I'm new on new on running an alliance, but um, there's lots of members of the alliance in the room. So you're like the bosses are out there looking at what's he going to say, <laughs> and I can say on this topic there is no shared agreement absolutely no shared agreement. What we'd all agree on the Alliance, on the Civil Society Alliance, and just to give you a bit of a background, it's, it's broadly, I think we sort of echoed, bringing different tribes together who impact and affect our diet. So there is health communities, there are concerns around animal welfare. We've talked a lot about climate. It's not just a climate crisis, as Mike's alluded to. We've got a biodiversity crisis. So across the piece, we're all completely agreement that we need less and better, more sustainable, healthy diets. In, in response to Mike's destination, there are increasingly shared agreement on that target. We might not all be agreed. We're saying that we need a 50% reduction in meat, and then we're think, talking about consumption right now, by 2030. And um, the Climate Change Committee had a target out last week, which people would follow, and some of the discussion around it, around meat. And, it, it's there, the destination is becoming increasingly clear. The less is hard, it's hard for business, it's hard for farmers, but we're coming close to it. I, I just wanted to share a few sort of sense around the cultured meat space, because it's sort of the reinvented future of meat, and some of you will know I've been working on this sort of future of protein, and I, I went to the corn factory a few years ago when we started out on this journey, which is very challenging for someone as deeply committed to food as me, because you go to the industrial estate that inspired Blade Runner, and you see a very, very interesting, successful business that's chucking out very good quality, affordable protein, and not a cow in sight, and not a green space in sight, but an amazing proposition. I love the, some of the proposition and the energy from some of the speakers, because, oh God, I'm sounding like, um, I'm sounding like I'm doing some sort of review of the speakers. Because, uh, I, yeah, I love the energy around it because people are doing what the NGOs have been doing for a while. They're articulating the reason for change. Why the hell are you creating a meat in a factory like that? Oh, 
we need to change. So I think they're doing a fantastic job. There's so much innovation going on, so much discussion. I think we're all here because of that innovation, and there are a few of you in the room that are doing amazing things. I think it's a really promising solution. Um, to be honest, I've got this grand challenge of a 50% reduction. It's hard changing people's diets. We know how hard, even how hard it is to talk about eating a bit less meat. And if these guys come along and say, we're going to cut your 30% and we're going to do it differently, we'll do this, it's pretty interesting. Um, and I think it's quite interesting, the challenge back, so I think one or two people have moaned from the Alliance a bit why I'm on this panel. And, and we are a broad church with many people, and we're trying critically to engage, as Mike said, the farming community and the health community. And I've said, well, this is the new competitor on the block. These are the new competitors. This is the new competitor. Articulate your place at the table as me. Say what you're doing. How are you delivering to our aspirations of climate proofing, delivering us a health? So I think it's, let's treat it as a new competitor. Let the meat industry treat it as a new competitor. Let's articulate it why. Why I feel slightly anxious. Can I share my anxiety? A little bit of the anxiety. One is, I think Mike's alluded to, public attitudes can shift very quickly. Um, We've got some anecdotal polling, which another retailer shared with us, that suggests that people are dropping meat in the UK in quite a significant level amongst that younger generation at the moment. So will we need this? You know, We're not talking about, there are different narratives going on. There are some narratives that there's no future for animals. We're not in that camp. We think less and better, and we need a reduction. We need to replace the better with much higher animal welfare. So I think there's a question around public attitudes. I think there's something about who owns the production. Many people across the Alliance, many of the organizations that you know, will be very anxious about who owns that technology uh, and how it's used. They've seen Monsanto, they've seen GMO, they've had those fights, they're up for those fights again. I can tell you they're absolutely up for them. Um, and then a big critical crisis of our time, which I've been to many discussions at Chatham House recently and convened so well, is, is the, this double burden the health burden and the climate burden. We're not eating better. We're not eating better. We're eating worse every day. So how does this solve this challenge? And I think one of the things we do need to be eating more plants. We do need to be eating less processed food. And how do we, how do we, how do we really get to that? And something we alluded to in a discussion before, how do we bring everybody on that journey? So my sense is out there now, I've spent on this journey for a few years in the last six months, it's really polarized. Two months ago, I spoke to 120 livestock farmers in Harrogate who felt very anxious that they just see this torrade of, like, there's no future for you. The corn picture doesn't show the meat industry as a whole. There, there is a section of that, but there are many farmers trying to do the right thing, as Mike's alluded to. Um, and two weeks ago, I was at the Vegan Society Grow Green panel, um, where there was also some anxiety around... Um, what that future lays. So I think it's, it's, it's a brilliant discussion to be having, and I sort of echo what the others say, that we need to find that common ground and drive it, and these solutions become increasingly important if we can't move to deliver some of those sort of challenges ahead. Thank you, Simon. Um, can we give a, ground, a round of applause to all the amazing speakers? So, um, so now we open for questions, but before I do that, uh, can I have the clicker, please? I wanted to do a thought experiment with you, so you just bear with me. Um, can we have, uh, do, do I just do the green thing? Yeah. Oh, what did you say? Okay, so um, just come with me on this thought experiment journey, okay? Um, that, you know, if you eat cultured meat, um, and assuming that you know they are affordable and not like three hundred thousand a piece, but that they're affordable and you can buy them at supermarket, or so you would. Would you, how many would you of you would eat chicken? Raise your hand. Cultured chicken. Okay. Okay. So if you can grow chicken, you can possibly grow dodo. So have dodo, do, if someone's selling, if, you know, in 2030, Mark and Spencer selling dodo nuggets, would you eat it? Okay. So, 
Now it's pushing a little bit, okay? So let's not judge too much. Um, if you would eat animals, and if it's cultured, would you eat another person? Um, how many of you would, you're not killing anybody, it's cultured cell from another human being. How many of you would eat that? I would, actually. <laughs> you know. Last question. Um, if it was a celebrity, <laughs> how many of you would you, uh, you, know, you can pick whichever, whoever you want to, right? Um, how many would you, if there is celebrity meat being sold in the future in the form of a burger, would you buy them? How many would you say yes? Johnny Depp, whoever, whatever rocks your boat. Um, okay, no takers? I would do, wait, no? Okay, everyone? Okay, so, well, thank you very much. Um, so now, we have to open, so because I'm the chair, I get to ask the fir first question, and then I will open up for you guys. Um, and then before you stand up, we'll have our great people to, with Mike to pass it along, and then say who you are, who you're affiliated with. Um, so my question is, now that we've done the thought experiment, um, but also just thinking about the future of meat, and you know, we think of different shapes of it, what are the ethical and the societal implications of future of meat? Any ticker? You want to have a go? Well, I think we've got to begin at the starting point that we know what the negative ethical and societal implications of the current system are. So I think I, it's frustrating when that question is kind of used as a to stop the conversation and say, well, we don't know, you know, what are the impacts of culture meat going to be in 20, 30 years, so we shouldn't go there kind of thing. I think that should definitely be a question on the table that we need an open and candid discussion between all stakeholders about. Um, I mean, Josh, I'm sure you can speak to this better than I can, but I think, well, for both plant-based and cultured, there's real questions around how the scale-up is going to happen. I mean, even for plant-based, in terms of the supply chain that exists right now and how that's going to be scaled up, we don't just want to shift from one problem to the next in terms of, you know, go from monocropping um, soy for animal feed to monocropping soy and pea for alternative plant-based proteins. So we don't want to transfer any of those problems over. Um, <coughs> for cultured meat, I think how that happens at scale and the actual infrastructure that's required is a big open question right now that a lot of development needs to go into. Um, so, yeah. Uh, and just, just to add ever so briefly to that, I, I think the, the fourth industrial revolution that looms ahead of us, we've got a big decision to make in the next five years, to use it for good or for bad. And a lot of, and that spans everything from corporate control to the use of data, privacy, to engaging people in terms of what this technology, a lot of which will be very complicated and very invisible to the human eye, what does it actually mean to us? So I think every technology leap has brought brilliant benefits, has brought some really significant unintended consequences. You only have to look at what's happening with the electric car industry now and the dash to secure a number of precious metals around the planet, the impact of mining in some very, very troubled states around the world. Every fantastic leap that we're planning to do, we have to look out for those underpinning dangers. And that's why, again, I, I build upon what Simon says. We need a dialogue, because I think we can all dash off in the next 12 months in terms of reducing the impact of the meat industry, and in five years' time, look, look back and think, we've ended up in the wrong place. We need a really good discussion about the future. But, but ultimately, I, I think in terms of the ethics, it should be up to people to decide, right? I don't know how many people here, probably quite a few, but I've been to a slaughterhouse, and it was a pretty harrowing experience. And I would hope that in five, 10 years' time, when the first, or hope maybe even sooner, but hopefully the, the first um, cultured meat plants are coming online, maybe there's one way you can go and do a tour, and you can do your slaughterhouse tour. And it should be clear, you can, people can make their own ethical decisions. And people will, because people just don't really understand that meat doesn't come wrapped in plastic, right? Yeah. <laughs> 
and and when people understand that, then maybe it, it sh these issues will kind of be a, a bit easier to discuss, I guess. Yeah, apparently the smell of a slaughterhouse will stay with you for a very long time. I've had many opportunities to visit, and because I'm a meat eater, I know that if I go, I will stop going. <laughs> I think you should go. So yeah, anyway, I haven't gone that, down that path. Um, can I then open to the floor? Um, I have a gentleman here. I have a lady and another lady. Uh, is it a lady? Oh, the, the lady in green. You go first. You have two ladies after you. Uh, ah, yeah, okay. Uh, so my name is Manfred Abe. I work for Unilever, and in uh, full disclosure, I'm uh, a seven-year vegan. So. Um, I think what we forget is that the amount of meat that's consumed now is historically very high. Mm -hmm. So we're actually been collectively as an industry or whoever drove us to eat more meat. We've been very, very effective in changing people's behavior. Mm -hmm. So I think we sometimes talk about this inevitability that, that meat is essentially a part of the diet. It's actually very unhealthy. We, we, most of us know that, that there's actually no health benefits. And I think when we do the transition to proteins, we have a huge opportunity to, to really connect it to the health aspect. So I think we need to be very careful in just satisfying people's need for meat uh, whilst not addressing the health issue. Um, and I, I, uh, I'd love to hear the panel's view, particularly Jos's uh, view uh, on that one. Yeah. Can, can we take the other two questions and we'll just do a couple questions, a couple of answers. Hi, my name is Olivia Collins, and uh, I'm a disruptive technologist. Uh, from each of your backgrounds, both as corporate and science, how do you aim to change public perception of alternative meats, especially when there's such a divide between public opinion and uh, scientific opinion and development? And there was the lady in green. Hi, um, I'm Eliza, I'm from the Department for Digital. Um, kind of, this is actually quite similar to your question. Um, looking at it, it seems like there are kind of two, two pa like kind of strands which are slightly paradoxical, which is that people think that natural is healthy. We want to tell them that, you know, have free ranging cattle that have eaten grass and had lovely lives, that's a good way to go, but also it's a good way to go to eat something that's come straight out of a machine. What's, how are we gonna balance that if we're trying to change behaviors anyway? And then we're telling people, go either side. There's good science that's healthy and good for you, but there's bad science because it's overly processed. How, how, how can we go about that behavioral change, making people receptive to tech, when, the, when we're at two different ends, I think is what I'm trying to ask. Josh, you wanted to, and I don't know if Mike... Yeah, there's a lot of different kind of questions. Uh, I'll try to just put a bit of perspective I guess firstly I totally agree with the with the health question so so I don't know maybe I'm gonna put my foot in it here but people come and say what well, what if uh, what if your meat causes cancer and the answer is is that it will because it's meat and we know that red meat causes cancer so if we're making the same stuff then it will have the same if we're if we're making something which is indistinguishable then yeah. those effects will also be there I think there is a chance to um, to change some of the current ways in terms of antibiotics and, and hormone usage, which is arguably perhaps more of an emotive issue than, than a genuine health concern, although certainly the, the antibiotic problem that Rosie alluded to in, in agriculture is, is massive. Um, for the other questions about the the I, I, I this is not really my sphere of expertise so i am kind of worried about trying to make the meat in the first place but i think that the direction is going is going the right way for sure there's certainly going to be some people who who really like the natural angle and and we're never going to win over um but ultimately if if it tastes as good and we can get it to as cheap or nearly as cheap, then I think yeah. there's actually a lot of people who, who are going to be receptive to this and aren't going to really be turned off by the, by the yuck factor of it, of it being a machine, especially if we can 
especially as the, the knowledge increases of, of what the alternative is, because actual meat is quite yucky. Yeah, no celebrity burger, then. A anybody? Yeah, I'll ask Mike. Mike, yeah. Mike do you want to? Well, j j just a sort of quick intervention. I think all those questions are tied together by the world's emotion in human beings. I think so far the debate at the moment is being made by a number of professional voices, you know, either campaigners or the industry or startups, all of whom are working very, very hard to prove a particular point. I think we all need to work harder to prove that point. Again, I will meet a lot of farmers very proud about what they do, very clear that what they do is different from these average figures that they're hearing about the, the problems of the, of the meat industry. It is up to us supporting those farmers to tell those stories and to make sure that they can stand up and engage people around them. The second thing is we need choice. Because what I think we've heard today is there's lots of different reasons why people eat food and how they eat food. You can already see a food system appearing generally, not just meat, about the laboratory. And a food system that's appearing that's about hyper-local, emotional connection with producers within 30 miles of you. Neither of them are wrong. They're all part of the landscape. And they all have to be part of the solution. And we, again, the retailer who's the connector between the food producers and the food consumers, has to make sure that we're crystal clear of sharing the information, the pros and cons of every step in the diet. Because every place of the diet is not without consequence. And we need to share that better with people in the future, and particularly support farmers in telling their stories. Simon? Yeah, I mean, just to play the ante, I don't want to sit on a panel where we talk about cheap food. So the externalities of our food system, we're not paying the true costs. Lots of people in the room have worked on that area. So I think part of the challenge we've got is, as you say, meat has got very cheap, particularly sources like chicken and pork now, and the externalities are not properly put in. So we need a proper price. But the prop challenge with that, and which is the challenge for me and for many people in this room, is then you've got the question, well, how's the affordability angle? So I think we need to start addressing that head on you know, we need to stop this idea of cheap food for essentially people, you know, for people who can't afford it and move that dial and start to say we need good food for all. Because the anxiety I have with some of this discussion is we get a two-tier system. It's starting to emerge. You know, those of us that eat better meat, those of us that eat lab meat, and then the rest, which might be the industrial chicken or the industrial thing, the system that we all feel very uncomfortable with on the panel. So I think I'm just with a watch out. Let's not talk about cheap food. Yeah, that's a good point. Sure, can I just pick up on the, well, both questions, I suppose, but more on the, on the health side, I totally agree. We really need to look holistically at this. Again, to my point about silo working, you know, nutrition is so divided at the moment. We're not looking at, at these issues as one. And that is a challenge in itself, putting those methodologies together. Um, in terms, we do have to be careful that we don't also paint the picture that all vegan diets are inherently healthier. People still need, it's not good enough to just cut meat out of your diet and all your problems are solved. Uh, at the same time, in developing countries, some, um, you know, some tribes are completely reliant on milk, blood, and, and meat, and we, we can't say that's wrong and that is <laughs> an irrelevance. It's very important. Um, in terms of, of corn uh, and, and microproteins benefits, um, we're actually a complete protein. Um, we're a great source of fiber, and we, so we need to be really careful about looking at not only our macronutrients, but also our, our micronutrients. There isn't a silver bullet, I don't think. Um, in terms of changing perceptions um, of some of these products, I think we just have to try and make them better. That sounds really simple, but things like convenience are, are really key. Affordability, of course, and equitable access as well. But some of these, we're increasingly eating on our own, eating out, um, wanting quick fixes. We're not, we don't have the cooking skills and the will and the way that we, that we used to in our busy lives. So making those changes that it's the more convenient, it's the natural choice, it's the easier choice, um, nudge. In, in particular, in canteens, um, are some of those quick wins in terms of game behavior change. You want to make a point? Ever so briefly, just responding to the very good point Simon made about externalities, I would welcome a price on carbon. Mm. Absolutely. If there's one thing that will shift the marketplace yeah. in the right direction, is what happened with the dear old landfill tax 20 years ago, which is an escalating price that gives you certainty to invest into a very, very different future. So a price on carbon, yeah, I don't know if it's feasible to have a price on nature that captures the, the biodiversity loss we've got at the moment, but let's start with the price on carbon. Yeah. Um, wow. <laughs> okay, we have 15 minutes. 
Um, so let's do the following, because I actually want to have some wine and some Beyond <laughs> Burger. So I'm going to do here first, and because I have my boss here, so I will have Bernice have a question. Then um, just, so I'm, I'm okay. Okay, let me organize. Two, so what I'm going to organize is by section, okay? So the people on this section, here, Bernice and two more people on the front section, and then I'm going to move to that section and that, but very quickly. I think this follows quite, so Bernice Lee from Hoffman Center at Chatham House, it follows quite nicely from what Mike and, and Simon both said and also on the question about affordability. I, I think we, we've done a great job describing the personal and the emotional, but of course these are political decisions as well. And, and we talked about how we ended up in the system that we had, the amount of meat that we do eat today, is not just a question of choice, but a question of you know, who creates the incentive systems, whether it's government incentives, or the food environment, or the retail environment, that in some ways nudge us into different directions. So my question to you would be, if there is indeed a role for government, how do you think the government's chip will fall when it comes to things like lab? or sell, sell cult, cultured meat, because you know, GM wasn't just shaped by preferences, it was also shaped by political decisions. Second, we have had spectacular failures in changing our agriculture systems for the better part of many, many decades. How would we go about it? And I know this is a really unfair question, but it would be great to hear your voice, because oftentimes it's the wants to talk about it, more folks like you guys who talk about how, what are the best way to realign these incentives. Um, we had a, oh, oh my God, how, like, how do they multiply? <laughs> Um, okay. <laughs> I'm not um, sure I'm doing a very good job. Like uh, Charles Spencer, no uh, particular affiliation, but uh, like Tess, I should uh, disclose I'm a third generation livestock farmer's son, uh, uh, cattle and sheep uh, in the Highlands of Scotland, where, believe me, the economics do not permit any inputs other than a bit of salt lick. Uh, my question um, is around um, uh, in intensive and extensive. Yeah. When we look at that repellent photograph that Tess put on the screen of a, a North American feedlot, uh, where the slurry lagoon is producing methane 21 times more um, a greenhouse effect than the same uh, mass of carbon dioxide, only exists because of an exemption from federal uh, EPA regulations, etc. Uh, that makes my stomach heave. That's not livestock. That's not husbandry. It's repellent, and it's and it's wrong. It is, however, where cheap uh, uh, animal protein comes from. An extensively grazed, um, uh, well-managed livestock farm surely is actually fixating mm. carbon, because if you are building up topsoil, you have humus, which is, of course, carbon, it's, it's plant material, uh, being fixated and being built up. So are we actually talking about reinventing meat in terms of abolishing intensively raised meat and actually privileging extensively raised meat? Because ultimately, could it be carbon positive mm. to consume well-managed, extensively raised meat. Thank you. Um, we have two ladies over there. I'm sorry, I'm going to just have to. Oh. Uh, Joyce De Silva, Compassion and Well Farming. Um, I need to admit that I've been a vegan for 44 years. <laughs> and you, you can survive. And I've been to two slaughterhouses. Um, and I quite agree with everything that's been said about them. Um, I just think two things I'd like to put to you. I don't think you need to aim your products at vegans and vegetarians. As a vegan myself, I wouldn't eat cultured meat, though I would eat the plant-based burger, except that I don't eat burgers much. Um, I do think that if Mike is talking about trying to make meat production kind of climate-friendly, just be very careful about the animal welfare impacts because you can keep all your cows indoors and extract the methane, and the cows have miserable, they have miserable lives, and they're sentient beings, and we owe them more than that. I hope you agree. The, the lady next to and no, I'm Olga Kiko. I'm also from Compassion Well Farming. Um, I wanted to ask regarding the medium used to grow uh, cultured meat cells. Um, so far we know that it is harvested from embryos, so there is some controversy there. Uh, Peter Verstrate from Mosa Meat had said that um, Mosa Meat is looking towards actually replacing this. Will the replacement, uh, are you close to any replacement, and will that include GMOs? I think I'll have to. Yeah. Specifically well, to you and yeah, the other questions on. So, so, uh, so currently the full process that we have is not completely animal free. Before we launch any 
product, it will have to be totally animal free. That's absolutely in the in the, the red lines. So if we can't make that happen, then at some point we will have to pull the plug. Um, ultimately, yeah. Uh, in terms of GMOs, that we this is a whole nother kind of kettle of fish, I guess. So the process that I described here, we think most closely kind of mimics the um, the natural process that occurs it, that occurs within a cow. The cells are not genetically modified in any way. They're not transfected. They don't get given any new genes or anything, even temporarily. Um, that's not the case for all potential um, cultured meat companies. And there are other um, ways that you could do it that would involve um, stem cells, which would have the advantage that you wouldn't need to keep going back to the animal and taking a biopsy and the disadvantage in some ways that you're now creating something that is really quite far removed from traditional meat. Um, maybe we can discuss more afterwards. But in terms of the technical questions, yeah, it will have to be totally animal free. You're right that the fetal bovine serum that we use for, for some parts of the process, if the, the, the total worldwide amount of cattle would fall as much as we might hope, then there will not we will not be able to source this anymore, so it, it wouldn't be an option anyway. So does anyone on the panel want to take the question on the role of government or expensive versus intensive? Yeah, just on a quick, so I think there's a massive role for government. It's quite interesting that probably Mike and I have quite a lot in common. Group representing sort of a big corporate business and a lot of NGOs. There isn't any government on the panel. I think we need a joined up strategy around food and farming, which we might get in the UK over the next few months. So watch this space, which this, this agenda needs to play straight into the heart of it. I think the challenge we've got is looking at your map, Bernice, is protein's a totally global system. And we've landed in this really weird system where we're shipping soy across the world, chickens across the world, but for this price thing. And so I play back to you, it, it's hugely political. We need to have those, it's a political discussion around self-sufficiency, how we use land, how we eat into the future, much wider than, yeah. th than this. Yeah, the only thing I would add to that is your, your language around incentives is quite important because we've heard, um, I mean, I'm sure Rosie will talk about this, but you know, potentially talk of a meat tax, for example, and that's a, a different type of incentive. That's a, a sort of punishment versus reward. And we need to think really carefully about how we want to approach that and who that's going to affect worse and whether you are going to get the sort of outcomes that you see with plastic bags as you would with something as, as emotive as meat. Um, <clears throat> in terms of, can I answer another question while I'm going. <laughs> um, in terms of extensively raised meat, I totally agree. Farmers are custodians of the land and we should be incentivizing them differently. So I'm, I'm totally on, on board. We can look at that. Um, and in terms of aiming products at vegetarians and vegans, um, I agree we don't, we don't do that necessarily at Quan either. Um, we do have ambitions to be a fully vegan company, but 83% of our customers aren't aren't vegetarian or vegan. Um, so there is that place for that transition. And there's a role for meat alternatives and, and cultured meats in, in any sort of diet. Rosie, do you want to say anything? Yeah, I guess I'll just pick up on the economic cost point, which has come up in a few of the questions in the discussion. Um, from our work with investors, I mean, I, I think it's inevitable, although the externalities, as Simon pointed out, just aren't accounted for right now. I think it's inevitable that we'll start to see this kind of balance out and hopefully level the playing field a little bit for these alternatives and the real costs of intensive livestock production starting to, to manifest themselves. I mean, you've only got to look at the current outbreak of African swine fever, which is you know, really becoming a global issue right now, but it's decimating the Chinese hog industry, for instance, and having a massive impact on pork prices globally, really. Um, and in contrast to that, you have the Beyond Meat IPO, which just happened last week, and you have these market analysts who are saying you know, the potential for this industry is huge, even if it just follows the trajectory of plant-based milk, which has gone to from basically nothing to 15% of the global meat, uh, milk market in the past decade or so. Just following that, it could be a $40 billion industry. So uh, the, I think we'll see over the next, in the short term, really, these things starting to balance out. And hopefully, that will provide a, a level playing field. But I agree, 
you know, it's so important for governments and policy to reinforce that and encourage that and incentivize the right things. And the opportunity for kind of government investment in this is, is huge. If you think about investment in clean energy, the same, the same kind of thing should be happening for this type of technology. So. Um, but it's very, very quickly. Um, the government role, yes, we need a joined up food and farming strategy for the long term, absolutely aligned with the same strategy for nature. Um, the two things work together. We're looking at the whole subsidy system now as we come out of the common agricultural policy. There's a great opportunity to align that with that 25 year vision for food, farming, and nature at the same time. Um, I talked about Board Beer in Ireland, a systemic extension service to help farmers transition to, into a new form of production as well. I think that will be hugely helpful in the UK as well. I talked about a price on carbon. Uh, I'm definitely not sure about a meat tax. I don't think that would work in practice. Me having to work out how I deal with the price of carbon coming from the products I sell, that's much more useful, I think, in terms of going forward. Charles, Joyce, I think you're talking about the same thing here. The, the laws of unintended consequences. We can't just look at this through one carbon lens with the result that animals suffer or some other part of nature, natural systems suffer. And that's my point. We do need a proper debate over the next one or two years about where we're trying to head to. I do absolutely believe in the entrepreneurial opportunity, Charles, for farmers to be paid to lock up carbon. Do they have to prove that they're doing that? Yes, we can't just assume that we've done that like this way for 100 years, now give me the money. That's not possible. But if there's a proper certification scheme that rewards farmers for doing that, Again, turns back to the government issue. If every farmer was given the opportunity to be a source of renewable energy as well, lots of farmers have experimented with it, but we, again, we could be much more systemic about that as well. So just a few ideas about how we involve both farmers as entrepreneurs and the policy system. So Nina is like signaling me that I have to close the session, but I feel that I haven't given people on that end. So I have two, I'm gonna do two people. And then I'll close the session. So I have the lady and the gentleman there on the back. Thanks very much. Geraldine Gilbert from Forum for the Future, discerning flexitarian. Um, it's more of a comment than a question. And it was just to say um, the, 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 the key question is how do we make it normal to reinvent meat, have less of it, better meat, and then all the meat alternatives that have low impact. And I just wanted to point to the role of chefs in all that. Mm -hmm. And in the same way that farmers are the connection between the land and eaters, chefs are the connection between people and, and everything else to do with food. Um, we, lots of you know about the Protein Challenge 2040 at Forum. Part of that is around um, yeah, rebalancing protein consumption in diets, and we're going to be piloting a revised curriculum for what the training that chefs get. Because actually, what one enabler of all of this is making sure that chefs, in the broadest sense, chefs in food service as well, who prepare millions of meals every day, know how to get the best out of the alternative mm. ingredients, and at the moment they don't. So I just wanted to point to chefs as being really key to this, and one of the, you know, a note of hope, an enabler in all this. And I would challenge you next time you do this, if there were a follow-up to this event, I'd love to see someone from food service or a chef on the panel to share how you make that work and how you get people to eat the better alternatives. I think that would be. Thank you. We did try to bring a chef. He wasn't available. But <laughs> thank you for that. And then just the question for the gentleman. Uh, on, on the Hi, it's John Kayser from the Carbon Trust. Uh, I had a different sort of question that no one's mentioned yet, which is about jobs. Yeah. And I'd be very interested in what everyone thinks about how jobs and opportunities will change yeah. if all these systemic things actually happen. Okay, so jobs for the panel. I'll, I'll chip in with a, a very quick response. Influencers, absolutely. The, you know, the reasons, one of the reasons that a vegan vegetarian diet has flown yet again, even further in the last six, 12 months, is it's become Instagrammable, it's become interesting, it's become aspirational. Not everybody might be comfortable with that. Most people would probably want people to look through a lens of science and it's the right technical thing to do. It's exciting, it's emotional, it's the reason that Plant Kitchen's thrown off our shelves as well. So we have to have that excitement and delight about it. Just quickly on the jobs thing, absolutely over the next decade, there's gonna be a tremendous shift across the wider global economy as we shift from an unsustainable economy, hopefully to a truly sustainable one. A lot of old jobs will go, new jobs will emerge, but those are easy words to say in a room in London on a Thursday night. What does it mean to actual people who worked in a coal mine that were farmers, and this is my point about just transition, we've barely scratched the surface of taking society as a whole on, us, on a journey. And just because we have got science on our side doesn't mean that we can impose upon a wider society. That's what led to some of the fractures we've got today in the wider um, global uh, political system. We need to take people with us. 
Anybody else want to? Yeah, just to echo that. I mean, I've talked to quite a few of the unions in the UK, and they're very nervous about this agenda because of the job, jobs in meatpacking. I think yeah. maybe they're not very nice jobs. But you know, that, that conversation around the transition, both for farmers and for people, is really critical. And I totally agree um, around chefs as well, out of the four ends, making sure it's nice is incredibly important. We, uh, for corn, it's an interesting one as well because you think of corn as sort of a finished product almost, and we're trying to work with um, you know, young chefs at Westminster Kingsway College, for example, or um, some of the leading chefs in the Chef's Manifesto, um, you know, to, to start making them see alternative proteins as an ingredient in their own right, because you can do incredible, incredible things um, with these sorts of ingredients. So. Yeah, I think echoing again the, the the who owns the production is a huge question. If Moza Meat makes it big, I mean, Moza Meat doesn't see itself in the long run as a big meat producing company, right? We're scientists. <laughs> the the business model would be to license the technology, and choosing how and where that licensing goes, I think, is definitely going to be crucial, right? At some point, a farmer chose to, to, to buy a cow as his meat machine. And if he can buy one of our machines, then I think that's going to be a, a much better situation than having some sort of monster um, multinational corporation just pumping out this, this stuff behind closed doors. So yeah, ultimately, it's super exciting. And hopefully, we need to make the right decisions going into the future, I guess. Chris, did you want to make any? No. No? Well, so I'm actually five minutes. Uh, I have overrun by five minutes. Um, so I would like to thank you all very much for a very, very interesting discussion. I mean, I've, just by the, the show of hand questions, like it is a very topical issue. We, we, we hear about climate change all the time. And you know the, the fact that we have to change how we behave, how we eat, how we move move around cities is like a different kind of lifestyle means that we have to think about you know what are also the different societal economical political implications of this transition so thank you very much before i release you i have some announcements so um from here we have we have a reception upstairs and there's an exhibition uh, a note on exhibition, do not touch or eat them. <laughs> um, you will be served food, so just don't touch the exhibition, OK? And don't eat them. Um, and then I would like to thank uh, Nina, um, who's great, who put this together, and some of the colleagues from Hoffman Center. Sam was here also before. And I wanted to plug two things from our colleague from EER. So there are two reports. Um, one is, this was produced in 2015, and it was circulating during the Paris Agreement. And that kind of shaped some of the, put the discussion on alternative protein in the climate movement agenda. That was Laura, Anthony, and Catherine. And this is hot from press for, about the meat analog and the role of regulation. So you can download it online. And tomorrow, um, Laura, there, um, amazing Laura is doing a piece on BBC Expert Network. So she will summarize some of the key issues that we discussed here. And then so everything you want to know about analog, analog, meat analogous, whatever, future of meat, um, go to the website and check it out. Thank you very much. Thank you.